The medicine was starting to take effect. The patient became dizzy. You laid him down on the bed, sweat pouring off the patient's face. They start to inhale deeply. You hold her hand and reassure them. You go and get a basin of water on a cloth. Soak, ring, pat. Tending to their needs, comforting them. It will soon be over. The patient's breathing becomes rapid. Shallow, then slows. And slows until one final gasp and then silence. He's gone. You tidy up, pull the sheets to his neck and walk out of the room. His wife walks towards you in the hall. You stop her before she gets to the room. Is he sleeping? She asks. You nod. He's been so tired the past few days, don't you think? Again, you nod. Feeling the situation becoming uncomfortable, you ask her if she would like some tea. She smiles and nods. As she walks away, you wonder, will the medicine have the same effect on her? Would she die slower or quicker than him? Shall I find out? This was Jane Tuppen, and this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. Jane Tuppen would be known as the most unusual serial killer in history. Like many serial killers, she had an unhappy and unstable childhood. But unlike most female serial killers, Jane did the killings for a sexual thrill. As she took the lives of her victims, Jane would become erotically charged. She would hold them, caress them, until the life left them. Jane would say she couldn't resist the excitement, admitting she inspired to have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who ever lived. Born Horora Kelly on March 31st, 1854, to a poor Irish immigrant family. Her mother Bridget died of TB when Jane was about a year old. Her father, Peter, was a real piece of work, eccentric and abusive alcoholic. He would be given the lovely nickname Kelly the Crack, as in Crackpot, and would later become the source of insanity rumours. The most popular would be that he went mad and sewed his eyelids closed while he worked as a tailor. In 1860, Jane's father took her, aged six, and her sister, Delia, aged eight, to the Boston Female Asylum which was an orphanage to care for indigent girls. Their mission was to rescue, protect and instruct. Jane's father surrounded the two girls and would never return or see them again. Documents from the orphanage would note the two girls were rescued from a miserable home. Records about their experience inside do not exist. Other reports would show that Delia would go on to be a prostitute. An older sister, Nellie, who wasn't in the orphanage, was committed to an insane asylum. Jane stayed in the orphanage until November 1862. She was then placed as a servant in the home of Mrs. Anne Topin of Lowell. Jane was never formally adopted by the Topins, but felt secure enough to take their name, introducing herself as Jane Topin. 1885, Jane started to train as a nurse at Cambridge Hospital. Jane was well liked, bright, friendly, even being called Jolly Jane. Jane became close to patients and gave extra attention to her favourite ones. These patients were usually old and very sick. Jane, as nice and charming as she was, had a dark, sadistic side. Jane would use her patients as test subjects experimenting on them with morphine and atropine. Jane would later alter the medicine to see how it affected the nervous system. Jane would spend a lot of time with her patients. She would create fake medical charts and would even medicate her patients to slip in and out of consciousness. While the patients were unconscious, Jane used to sl sleep beside them in their bed. 1889, Jane was recommended for the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital. Several more would die under her care here before she was fired a year later. Jane would return to Cambridge 
but was soon let go because she would give opiates out recklessly. With a bad reputation following her, Jane began a career as a private nurse, which she did very well in, even though there was accusations of te theft connected to her. Jane befriended an elderly couple, a landlord and his wife. Jane would go on to murder them both one by one. Jane would later explain why she murdered them, saying they were feeble, fussy, old and cranky. This annoyance towards older people wasn't anything new for Jane. Colleagues would remark how Jane would often say that it was pointless keeping the old alive. 1889, Mary MacLear, 70, would fall ill when she visited Cambridge Hospital. Mary's doctors would assign their best nurse to care for her, Jane Topin. Mary would die after being poisoned by Jane. A month later, Jane used cyprocine, a white, odorless, bitter powder to kill a close friend, all because Jane wanted the friend's job as a dining hall matron. Jane would get the job once the friend died, but Jane didn't keep the job long. The administration would receive many complaints about Jane's lack of experience and about money going missing. At first, they let a settle period happen, but more and more complaints came in, so they had to fire her. From her foster home, the Topins, Jane would have a half-sister called Elizabeth Topin Brigham. Jane would visit Elizabeth from time to time. In 1889, Jane was on holidays in Buzzards Bay. While there, she set her sights on her next victim, Elizabeth. At the time, Elizabeth was suffering with depression, so Jane invited her to the Cape. While in the Cape, Jane took Elizabeth on a picnic. She had corned beef, taffy and mineral water all laced with stracosine. Elizabeth would die in Jane's arms, gasping for breath as Jane watched on. Now Jane had an agenda to kill an Elizabeth. Once Elizabeth died, Jane would anchor herself in Elizabeth's house. To her life, especially to J Elizabeth's now widow, Ormel. Jane strongly believed she could be his next wife. Within three days of living in the home, Jane killed the housekeeper. 77 year old Edna Bannister. Jane then took over Edna's duties in an attempt to impress Ormel, but it didn't work. Ormel would make it very clear he wasn't interested in Jane, not as a housekeeper nor as a wife. Jane still believed she was to be Ormel's next wife. He just needed more convincing. So Jane started to poison him. Not a lot, just enough to make him ill, and then she would care and nurse him back to health. Nightingale approach didn't work. Angry and deluded, Jane would accuse Ormel of getting her pregnant, and that they must get married. Enraged, Ormel had enough of this game and threw Jane out. Jane took rejection badly and attempted suicide with an overdose, but this too failed. So after this in 1901, Jane moved in with an old man named Alden Davis and his family. Jane moved in to mind Alden after his wife, Mattia, died. Mattia was murdered by Jane. Within weeks, Jane had murdered Alden, his sister, and two of his daughters. The death of the entire family sparked suspicion in state detectives who started to follow Jane. Minnie was one of Alden's daughters, murdered by Jane. Minnie's father-in-law suspected foul play immediately. He would consult a toxicologist and would have Minnie's body exhumed for examination. It found that Minnie died from morphine and atropamine poisoning. October 29, 1901, police arrested Jane. Jane would go on trial for the murder of the Davis family in the summer of 1902. Jane would confess to at least 31 murders to her lawyers, although some believe it's as high as 100. Jane would say it all started at 16 from a breakup of a relationship. The trial would be quick at 8 hours, and deliberations even quicker at 27 minutes. They found Jane Topin not guilty by reason of insanity, 
She spent the remainder of her life at Talton's State Hospital, dying August 17th, 1938. Jane is often referred to as an angel of mercy serial killer, a person who takes on a caregiving role and then attacks. Her victims depended on her, life, her for life and she would give them death. Although she murdered for more personal reasons, such as jealousy in the case of her foster sister, Jane would say she had to kill, that the urge was paralyzing if she didn't. Thanks for listening. Next time I'll be looking at Harriet Tubman, an African-American woman who escaped slavery, becoming a conductor of the Underground Railroad, leading enslaved people to freedom before the Civil War. All while Betty was on her head. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.